for inviting me today. I'm very, always very interested in these groups that uh, are associated with the university. I'm going to guess that many of you have worked at uh, Willamette or at the other universities in, in Oregon before attending or maybe are still working, but it's really interesting to coming and sharing uh, my passion for cheese with uh, what I expect to be a very intellectual group. So the expectations are great questions afterwards. <laughs> or, or in the middle, raise your hand and we'll have the microphone go around. But uh, very happy to, uh, to discuss all aspects of cheese and it could certainly be distilled spirits as well. I work in the food science department. We are especially uh, interested in fermentation. It's not all just fermenting milk, but most of it actually there's an alcohol bias too. So we do a lot of wine, uh, cider, beer, and distilled spirits. But we are talking about the non-alcoholic fermentation here. And uh, what I'll be mentioning or covering in this presentation is really talking about uh, the history of cheese, how to make cheese, kind of briefly covering a little bit about what's going on in Oregon, and then finishing off with the OSU cheese. I love to talk about the Willamette University cheese, but you don't have one, so uh, I'll stick with, uh, with OSU. So just a little bit to check up on your knowledge in the audience. So as I mentioned before, I expect great things from this group. But uh, where do you think these cheeses are from? England, yes, of course. Here. Switzerland, good. Ha, it's getting harder. Italy, very good. Spain, yes. So this is a particular easy cheese, a manchego cheese, made from uh, milk from the manchego sheep, and it's from the manchego region of Spain. And if you can see the windmills on here, that's because that was also where Don Quixote was from. So um, interesting cheese. These, France, yeah. You always can guess that the strangest looking cheeses tend to come from, uh, from France. These. So these are the new American cheeses. Because today in the US, you can find every single cheese that's made in Europe or elsewhere in the world. And they are absolutely as good here as they are in, in Europe. The cheese movement has progressed tremendously over the last three decades. And we now have, including here in Oregon, cheeses being produced that I actually sent to Europe on cheese competitions. Yeah, there are cheese competitions. And uh, we have multiple of them that have won first places in Europe, especially cheeses from Rogue Creamery, but also from uh, River's Edge, that's a small goat cheese company over by the coast that really produces amazing, amazing cheeses. All right, so of course cheese, it's fun. But uh, fun is not why OSU invest in having a professor in cheese. The real reason is that there's big business between, uh, behind cheese. So the first top graph to the left shows the uh, production of US cheese over the last uh, 10 years. And you can see that uh, cheese production is increasing. And similarly, consumption of cheese, that's the lower graph on the right here, that one is uh, increasing as well. So Americans today consume about 37 pounds of uh, cheese per year, um, which is, you know, when you think about it, a lot of cheese. So uh, <laughs> cheese business is pretty important. And we, for example, at OSU, send a lot of students into the dairy industry each year, and especially being the West Coast here, uh, it's uh, uh, cheese is really the main main uh, category our students work in. And uh, the good thing is that there's hope for improvement. You saw before that consumption has been going up for the last many years. Well, if you look at the US versus the rest of the world, there's still room for increased consumption. The left graph, I'm not sure you can read from the back, but the very left one is US cheese consumption, so about 16 kilos. But if you move over a little bit to the right, Germany, France, Italy, and then moved on to Denmark, Finland, 
close to twice the consumption of uh, cheese that we have in the US. So our marketing people look at this and think, okay, there's opportunities to, to keep growing. But of course, the real market they are interested in right now is moving cheese to, uh, to Asia. And you might say it's not really part of the Chinese cuisine, but uh, how many of you have tra traveled to China the last five, 10 years? Okay, so what do you see in China? You see pizza, Pizza Hut. You see uh, hamburgers. You see Starbucks. Lots of dairy consumption where, you know, a few decades ago, the Chinese were not consuming dairy products. Today they do, thanks to the US fast food industry. You know, I can say that with a straight face, but uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it is bringing dairy products to Asian countries. And people say, well, lactose, uh, I mean, there's a lactose intolerance in Asian countries, but aged cheese does not consume lact uh, contain lactose. So that is not a problem with, with many of these products. Okay. Moving on, so I'm going to just talk, we talk about cheese as if it's a new discovery with the artisan cheeses we're starting to see here the last two decades. But of course, cheese has been around for a very long time. And uh, there are references of cheese making that goes back about 6,000 years. So how is that uh, even possible? Well, of course, the reason why cheese exists is that it was a way to conserve milk. Milk, uh, raw milk does not stay fresh for very long, especially if it's not refrigerated. Um, so uh, people found out if they could ferment the milk and it would ferment by itself, turn it into cheese, they could keep it around for a long time. Same goes, of course, with the reason for why beer and wine were developed. That's also a way of preserving food and uh, uh, keep food for leaner times, but also avoid food poisoning, since many of these fermented products are, are very safe when stored at, at room temperature. So the reason why they could do it, uh, I mean why uh, people could make cheese 6,000 years ago, is really that, uh, for one thing, the bacteria, that's one of the key ingredients in cheese, well, they had that automatically because the milk was really dirty as it was real milk from the, from the animals. And what you also need in uh, cheese making is rennet, or the chymosin enzyme that coagulates the milk. Well, since the, one of the natural containers they had that was waterproof were the stomachs of animals they butchered, well, they put the milk in these stomachs, and that happens to be the natural source of the rennet enzyme. So by pure luck, they, had, they were bringing milk bacteria enzymes together, and out of that, of course, you get cheese. So that's, that's why we, we can go back so long and see find cheese. So, well, okay, this is what we talked about. The cheese originated in the Middle East, Fertile Crescent. So Turkey, Lebanon, Iran, Iraq, all of that part of the world. Uh, it wasn't cheese as we know it today, as we normally know it, though it's pretty similar to feta cheese. So very sour uh, cheese. And uh, back to some people uh, credit the Mongolians, and again back to them traveling with milk in these watertight stomachs that once they arrived, what they would have would be uh, whey and, and cheese curds, and from there the cheese is originated. But we also see uh, murals from 2000 BC in Egypt. They have uh, multiple references to uh, to uh, cheese making, and uh, they even found some cheese in, um, this is a photo of some, an old cheese sample that were found, or they didn't know it was uh, cheese until they analyzed it. And it was a mixture of both cow and goat's milk. So that's really fascinating that uh, they were already in those days making mixed milk cheeses, which is really considered pretty sophisticated cheeses today. And if we look at the written documentation, so move on from our, our carvings in, in, in rock. Well, certainly the Old Testament has references to cheese making, but also in more detail we get it in the Odyssey. So are you all familiar with the Odyssey? You know, this, 
man who spent five years traveling to get home to his wife, or even longer maybe, but um, took a long time. And on his trip, he came across a cyclops. On an island, it was this one-eyed monster. And they went into his cave. And what they saw there, and I'm sure when you read the, the, um, the Odyssey, you didn't pay attention to this. But maybe if you go back and reread it, you will see that it contains a description of the Cyclops' cheeses. That in his cave, there were cheese racks loaded with cheeses. And here's more lambs and kids that his pens could hold. So that means that once again, we have this mixture of uh, uh, goat and sheep milk that uh, the Cyclops were combining to, because he had kids and, and, and lamb. And he milked the ewes and the goats, and then let them out and strain, curdled the milk, put it in wicker strainers. If you look at how ricotta cheese, for example, is made, that's made exactly the way it's basically described here. So uh, fascinating what you can get, you know, and that was, I think the, uh, the Odyssey was written about 800 BC, and in the old uh, Greece, before they started writing it down, they had this oral storytelling tradition. So the story of Odyssey is expected to be quite a bit older than 800 BC. Then the ones who really commercialized and popularized, if that's the word, uh, uh, cheese, that was the Romans. And they brought cheese making with them wherever they went. The Romans went everywhere, at least if you think of a Eurocentric view. They went to North Africa, they went to the Middle East, they went to all over Europe, they went into England. And um, they are now leftover kind of cheese tools that you can find from the Romans. What's really fascinating is that they had written down oh, about 13 recipes on how to make cheese. And today, basically, all our cheeses can be traced back to these 13 recipes. So it's absolutely fascinating. It makes you wonder why a professor can study cheese today if the Romans figured it all out back, um, you know, 1500, 1600, 1800 years ago. And this, what you see here, is a cheese grater and looks a lot like what we use in our kitchens today to make uh, grated cheese with. By the way, if you have a choice between buying uh, Parmesan, grated Parmesan, or making it yourself, make it yourself. Buy a chunk of Parmesan and then shred it. Much, much better flavor. And obviously, the Romans believe that, too. This is a cheese press, and uh, also dating back to the Romans. And I don't know if you can see it from the back, but um, in the bottom of this rock press, there's kind of this snail. It's a shape so the whey can run out as the cheese is being pressed in here. And the interesting point is when you tip that the mold upside down to get the, the cheese out, it's going to look absolutely beautiful because it'll have the shape in the, in the top of it as well. But uh, very, very sophisticated cheese mold. OK. So now let's move you know, 2000, 1,500 years ahead and talk about cheeses today. Because what's fascinating is that just about each of the basic cheeses you see out there in the supermarket, there's a story behind them. That they are, they are unique, because, well, for multiple reasons. So I want to talk about just a couple of these. And this is the Comte. How many of you have ever tasted the Comte? OK, a few. Very good. So next time you go to, I don't know, probably Roth's here. Don't you have one of those in town? Market of choice, uh, perhaps Trader Joe's, certainly Whole Foods. These kind of, uh, and if you have some cheese shops here, I'm not quite sure. But they would have Comte cheese. So Comte cheese is from eastern France, the France Comte region. It's kind of north of the Alps, south of Alsace. So they are mountains, but not as big, more like huge hills, uh, not like the Alps, of course. So traditionally, in the summer, they would bring the cows up to the mountains, or the Jura Mountains, as they're called. And when you bring a cow up on a mountain, she doesn't stop producing milk. If anything, she'll produce more milk because she's up eating good quality grass in these meadows. So they had to do something with this milk 
Uh, and what they did was producing these very large cheeses. The Comte cheese, when it's fresh, weighs about 110 pounds. And, that was, and the Comte cheese has to be flipped over every two days. They turn it upside down. And 110 pounds was really considered the maximum weight a person could lift and flip over. So uh, really back to the reason why there are very few women in the dairy industry in the, in the good old days. But in those days, 110 pounds made for a really big cheese. And the idea, of course, was that you're making these cheeses well up away from the villages. So come fall, you had to bring these cheeses down. So if they'd made a cheese the size of a you know, camembert cheese, they would have ended up with millions of little camembert cheeses that they had to bring down. So that obviously wouldn't be practical. So they went for the biggest possible cheese they could make. And they went for pretty dry cheese that would dry and not go bad. Because once fall came, the cows and the cheeses came down from the mountains. But at that point, you couldn't really get them to the market. You know, there was snow and so on. So they had to age them over the winter. And the next spring, when the cheese is about nine, 10 months old, that's when they're finally getting it sent out to consumers. So Comte cheese basically has to be a hard, large aged cheese to fit the marketing pr process that these cheeses traditionally went through. What's interesting today is that it's an AOC cheese, Appellation d'origine contrôlée, which is the, also what we call PDO, protected designation of origin, meaning there are a, lot, a whole set of rules that regulates how to make the Comte cheese. And specifically, it has to make, be made in the French Comte, so in, the, in this region. It has to be made by the cows you see here, the Montbilliard cow. That's not a very efficient cow. And with efficient, we mean she only produces so much milk. But it's a way they've kept these traditional dairy breeds uh, alive, basically. She, uh, each cow must have access to about two and a half acre of uh, land of pasture. And it's, the farmer is not allowed to uh, spray the pasture. And the idea is you want to have the original vegetation fauna grow there with the concept being that you can then impact the flavor of the cheese based on what the cow is eating. And that is absolutely correct. We have data today in the cheese world showing that you know you are what you eat the same goes for the for the, the cheeses from that are made from milk from a cow so comte very very unique good uh, very unique uh, cheese so actually let me just point So come fall, though, these Montbilliard cows would come down from the uh, Jura Mountains. And at this point, they, uh, the farms were not specialized in those days. So you would only have one or two dairy cows. And the dairy cows would then be separated and brought out to wherever they belonged. And that means if the farmers during winter were going to make 110 pound cheese, they would have to milk the cows for over a week before they would be able to, uh, to actually make a cheese. So obviously, that wouldn't work. So instead, they would make, uh, milk their cow, or two cows in the morning, turn that milk into curd, cover it up in ash to kind of preserve the, the curd, then milk the cow again in the evening, turn that in milk into curd, and then combine the morning and evening curd. So of course, because the morning curd was covered in ash, you'd have that brown line through the middle of the cheese. And that's what you see on the Morbier cheese here. Morbier is a small village in the Jura Mountains as well. So this is where the winter cheese comes from. And a lot of people think it's blue mold, but it's not. It's, it's ash that's through the, the middle of the, the, these cheeses. Very good cheeses. These are also AOC protected, meaning there's a number of regulations that go with these, uh, these cheeses. And by the way, one of the most interesting sub-regulations on these cheeses is that milk cannot be produced more than six miles from the dairy processing facility. So when you think about that, the implications of that are enormous. 
because it means that you're going to have to have a cheese plant in every single village. You cannot have large cheese plants producing these uh, cheeses because you can only put so many cows into six miles radius of, the, of a cheese plant. So it's a way they keep, you know, these local, lots of local uh, cheese plants. I think there are 180 processing facilities producing the Morby and Comte cheeses today. And it's not that the French don't know how to make cheese making big scale. The, they make a lot of Emmental cheese. Emmental cheese is not protected by AOC rules or PDOs. So uh, Emmental is now produced mostly in, the, in Western uh, France, in the Brittany region. And they're mostly produced by Lactalis, for example, which is the world's largest cheese company. So when we tend to think, oh, Kraft is the world's biggest cheese company, that's not at all the case. The French are perfectly capable of producing large-scale commodity cheeses in uh, huge, huge dairy processing facilities. But these cheeses are not produced by Lactalis. They're produced by local, local producers. So the last cheese I wanted to mention, kind of the hist or not really a whole lot of history about, is the cheddar just because it's so popular, of course, in, in the US and in English-speaking countries. The um, cheddar comes from uh, uh, England, okay, the UK, from the region there. I think it's the Somerset region of uh, England. And there are some caves in that area. And it turned out that these cheddar caves were perfect for aging cheddar. So uh, that's really why the characteristics of the cheddar cheeses turned out the way they are, because they're very closely linked to the aging of this cheese in those, in those caves. However, I really wanted to talk about cheddar here because uh, the food industry often get a bad rep because we put colorants in, in food. And of course, the orange cheddar, the yellow cheddar, is colored with an added colorant. But there's nothing the dairy industry or cheddar producers would rather have than stop putting collar in their cheese. Because they have to not only buy the anato collar to put in their orange cheddar, but they also have to buy bleaching agents afterwards to bleach the whey. Because you cannot have orange whey when you're putting it into baked products, which is where a lot of the whey goes today. So they have to subsequently uh, bleach uh, all the whey that comes, and that's lots and lots of whey, since 90% of uh, milk becomes whey, at least in cheese making facilities. So the industry is running this long term educational um, program to make all of you stop consuming orange cheddar. And for example, if you look at what Tillamook is doing, they are now that two pound loaf. Have you noticed what coloring plastic it's put in? Orange or yellow, yes. So they can slowly, they're pulling the color out of the, the cheese and still letting it look orange because of the wrapping. But they're also naming now their, their what they want to say, their best cheddar. They're calling it the white vintage uh, cheese with the idea that best, the best cheddar out there is white. So, and they just started, Tillamook just started putting the white two pound loaf out in the supermarkets, believing people are now ready to uh, consume white cheddar. The reason why there's still some color, a lot of coloring of cheddar going on is that people, a lot of people will only buy orange cheese. Maybe they don't like the Swiss cheese, and Swiss cheese is always, you know, white, unnatural colored. So, well, when you get the colored, uh, cheese, you know what you're getting. So um, a long, long-term educational process. But hopefully in the decade or so, we will not really see the orange cheddar anymore. The, the bleaching, by the way, also oxidizes the flavor of the whey powder. So uh, it, it delivers an inferior quality product compared to if it was white to begin with. Um, before moving away from the cheddar, I just wanted to ask you all, do you know which is the most popular cheese in the US? <laughs> Lots of good suggestions. It is not Velveeta and uh, the, 
the good news is that processed cheese is the main category that keeps going down year after year in the US. People are consuming less and less of the processed cheeses, which by the way are fully dairy products. It's not like it's some um, interesting magic that goes into creating it, but uh, it's just not what we consider great cheese. However, the main cheese is mozzarella. And mozzarella, of course, is, goes into the pizza. And the dairy farmers owe a lot to pizza. If it wasn't for the pizza, there'd be you know, 20% fewer uh, cows out in the pastures, or in the barns here in the US. Very, very important how a dietary habit, you know, that many people gain as college students or before, really can uh, translate into a tremendous opportunity for, for the dairy industry. Okay, moving, moving on. So this is really just to say that all the cheeses out there have a unique story behind them, just like the Comte or Morbier that I just talked about. And it's very, very fascinating, the history of cheese, to look, in, to look into that. So how do we make cheese? Well, of course, you start with uh, the animal. So in this case, I put a cow in there, but it could just as well have been sheep or goat. So we don't, and does anybody know what the last dairy animal that you see in the US is? It's buffalo. So not the bison buffalo, but more of a border buffalo. And the reason for that is uh, that uh, the mozzarella, traditionally made from buffalo milk. So um, you get the milk, add the bacteria, add the rennet. What is the last one we're adding? Salt, absolutely. So there's been a lot of talk about removing salt from our diet. And cheese contains quite a bit of salt. There's about somewhere from 1.5% to 2% salt in, in cheese. And that's not insignificant. Uh, however, the salt is not just there for flavor. Have you tasted low salt cheeses? They're not fabulous. Uh, so, but it's not just the flavor, actually, the salt, uh, the taste of salt. It's also, salt is put in there to control the starter bacteria. So control the bacteria we already put in to begin with. Well, if they're allowed to just keep fermenting, we get a tremendously sour cheese. So it'll all be like feta. So by putting salt in, we control the acidity in our, in our cheese. And a number of other reasons too, but the salt has to be there. So all the research we've had about uh, making, making low sodium salts or finding replacements, putting potassium in, none of them have been successful. And at this point, you know, what we are recommending now is if you need to lower the salt from your cheese, you probably want to eat less cheese. But um, eat, the, eat the normal, normal cheese. Because well, even though there's a lot of research, we've not come up with good alternatives yet. And the same, of course, go for the low-fat versions of, of cheese. So anyway, moving on, we mix it all. We get the curds and the whey, and we age it, and we end up with uh, the cheese. So now when you think about cheeses, there are hundreds of different cheeses out there. They taste differently, they smell differently, they look differently, and basically they all have these four ingredients in them. So um, how do you think they do that? How can you get so differently different cheeses? when you are really putting the same thing in there. Any ideas? Yeah, you can change the bacteria, exactly. And that, for example, if you want to make Swiss cheese, you put cheeses in there that produce high levels of CO2, uh, bacteria that produce high levels of CO2. If you want to make cheddar, you want to make sure not to get those in there, of course. Uh, you can change the process a little bit. You can press it, you can not press it, you can age it, you can not age it. But it's fascinating that no cheeses have flavor added to them. So even though these flavors are so intense and you come from milk that's very, very bland, I hope there's no dairy farmers in here that I offend, but the fact is there's not much flavor to milk. 
And the ingredients we put in besides salt are not flavors, are not flavorful. So all the flavor that you see in the, in the cheese was there to begin with. It comes from the fat and the proteins that are in the milk, and they're basically just waiting for the cheesemaker to release these flavors or liberate them. And that's where we get the very unique cheese flavors. And that's truly fascinating. Normally when you look at a, a food product, you have a pretty long ingredient list. But for cheeses, it's a very short ingredient list, and yet the flavors are absolutely astonishingly different and can be really, really intense or bland, whatever, whatever cheese you're getting. And that's really kind of the miracle of, of, of cheese, that you can get so many places starting with the same ingredients, which is truly, truly neat and makes it really, really fun for, to study, study cheeses. So I want to go through a process of, uh, for how to make cheese. And I could have picked a cheddar, but I don't know if any of you have been to uh, Tilma Creamery. But nowadays, to keep a product safe and um, consistent, it's, it, every, all the process is run inside closed containers. So you basically don't see anything. And it's really not that exciting to look at. So I, picked a raw milk washed rind cheese from also from Eastern France. And if you're starting to see a trend here from the French Comte, it's because I spent a year there on sabbatical about a decade ago. So um, anyway, Mondor, this cheese is actually infamous because back in the 80s, people started dying in the, in the Eastern France and Western Switzerland, and they died from listeria. And the health organizations knew there was something going on, or whatever the health, health department was called. And they kind of knew it was associated with cheeses. They kind of knew it was associated with this cheese. But they didn't want to say anything, because uh, this cheese was so important for the region's economic situation and well-being that they kept it secret. So today it's kind of, it was, and actually it was some journalists who first started looking at, you know, there seem to be quite a few people dying from listeria in, um, in this same region of France and Switzerland. So it's, uh, once that came out, you know, today, it's a case study we can study on how not to do if you are with the health department that don't keep things secret and hope it'll go away because it really doesn't. So uh, even today, this cheese, because it is a high risk, high risk cheese, it's a raw milk, fresh, high moisture, high pH cheese. So today, every lot of cheese they make, they test for listeria. And they still destroy about 4% of the, the amount of cheeses. So they have not been able, even with all the studying of this process and everything they do, they've not been able to eradicate listeria in their raw milk cheese. Okay, so the way to make Mondor, start here, this is a cheese, cheese vat. You have the milk, they've added the, they've added the bacteria, and now they're adding the rennet, so they need to mix it up. And after you've added the rennet, it sits for about half an hour, and it coagulates and looks a lot like a yogurt. At this point, it's cut. And they have these knives that are basically metal frames with wire through it. And they pull that through the, the, the curd or the coagulated milk. And what you get is the separated curds and, and whey. It's a little like in your yogurt. You know, if you shake up a yogurt after a while, you'll start the next day, you'll see cinereses. That's the whey that's forming on top. So here they are putting the, they are emptying out of the cheese vat. You get the curd in and it formed into these block molds. And what he has in his hand is not the dustbin from the, from the floor. <laughs> it's, it's a real tool. And in fact, we have a bunch of those at OSU as well. It's used for the soft milk, uh, soft uh, cheeses in, uh, that we have French cheeses we make. Here are the cheeses. They've just been made. They've come out of the cheese mold. And then the top rack, if you look at the rack below, they're still inside the block mold, the plastic shapes that kind of determines the shape of the cheese. At that point, it's put in a salt brine, and it sits in here depending on the size of the, of the cheese. So for Mondor, probably half an hour, 45 minutes. 
if it was Gouda cheese, uh, Gouda, it would sit for uh, potentially days in the salt brine. And now it's being aged. And you can see these are wooden shelves. This is what there are all kinds of discussions with the ODA Food Safety Department, as you can imagine. So Oregon Department of Agriculture and our artisan cheesemakers about whether we can have wooden shelves or not for aging our cheeses. In fact, a couple of years ago, the FDA tried to outlaw wooden shelves in aging of cheeses here in the US. And it was really one of those cases where people said it was trying to solve a solution to a problem that didn't exist because they could not find a single situation where cheese actually did get contaminated from the wooden shelves. So after an uproar against it, wooden shelves, FDA backed away and wooden shelves are still allowed in, in the US for aging of, of cheese. So you can see here it has this interesting uh, mold growing on it. And what these ladies are doing in the middle of the aging room, we'll look at in a second. They are, oh, here's a close up of the, the cheeses. There's a little bark around them. That's a bark from a native tree from that region um, that gives them quite a bit of flavor as well for packaging. But here she's uh, washing the cheese. And what they do, this is a high moisture cheese, and every second or third day, they brush it over with the salt solution with different bacteria, yeast, and molds on it to give it that unique uh, growth on the, on the surface. And here they're getting ready to pack the cheese. It's being packed into that uh, little wooden box, and it's ready to, to sell then. So that's kind of how you're making the Mondo cheese. Can you imagine? A little bit different than what Tilmok makes their cheddar. So on to Oregon and the dairy industry in Oregon. So I assume many of you have lived here for quite a few years, so you probably know the, the dairy companies in our state. So do you know any besides Tillamook? <laughs> well, Ammon Valley Cheese, OK. That was bought up recently. Bandon. Uh, so Bandon Cheese was sold to Tillamook. <laughs> and um, a little over a decade ago. So it's now a brand, and Tillamook really purchased it not because they wanted a cheese plant or the res recipe, but because they wanted to be sure to control the label. They didn't need Kraft to come in and start selling Bandon cheese, for example. So Tillamook purchased the, the Bandon name and use it themselves now as well for the second, second cheese. Which one? Not there anymore. The only one we have now is Face Rock Creamery that came in where Bandon used to be. We don't have any other uh, cheese companies down there. We have Rogue in Central Point, Rogue Creamery. That was just bought, part, not bought up, but they partner now with a large French cheese company. So, Dairy, Gold. Dairy Gold, of course. Dairy Gold and Tillamook are the main uh, cooperatives in the Northwest and they control nearly all the milk. There's hardly any private creameries left. We have one dairy gold plant in uh, Oregon. It's up in Portland. Any other ones? Blue Heron is not producing their own cheese. They, they have a way of making it look like they make their own cheese, but uh, <laughs> they, they don't. However, however, they have a nice business set up, and they introduce a lot of people to good cheese. So. They, they serve a really nice function. Cougar Gold, it's a fantastic cheese, yes. So however, I hope you know that uh, we, we have the Beaver Classic, that's our cheese. <laughs> so we hired the, the gentleman who for 29 years had made, been in charge of Cougar Gold up at Washington State. We hired him and he started up the cheese production at OSU. So our cheese has a little bit of the Cougar Gold DNA in it. We, um, but we, with all of that, I know football teams have rivalries and so on. The cheese programs, the dairy programs at the different universities, we get along really well. We work together. Doesn't mean that we don't want Beaver Classic to be the best, but um, it, it's not. We are, we're good friends with the, with the Cougar Gold folks. 
So here are the creameries, the traditional kind of conventional creameries in Oregon. And this is really unique because today in, uh, in the US, most states have only a few creameries. The companies have grown so large. But Oregon still has these kind of middle-sized dairy companies owned by private families. Basically, it runs in, in generations, such as Lockmead, Alpen Rose in Portland. Uh, there's uh, Springfield Creamery with Nancy's Yogurt, um, Umqua Dairy, Eberhard in Redmond. So we still have these companies around, and I hope we'll keep them, because that's really what makes our dairy situation very unique. And then, of course, we have our artisan creameries. Um, so when you look at what's happened in Oregon is that we've slowly losing these traditional dairies. I mean, in, in Salem, uh, you are the poster child, basically, for lo losing dairies, because you have none left anymore. Mallory's, Deluxe, and what was the last one? Curly's, Curly's yes. So they're gone. There used to be three companies producing dairy products in Oregon. Today they're well, Willamette Valley cheese, yes, but uh, not at the same size as the other ones used to be. So fortunately, as the conventional dairies have kind of gone down, we have a number of the artisans that have uh, started up instead. And that helps making our dairy situation very lively and interesting in, in Oregon. So uh, here are some of the fo some photos from some of our local, uh, well, some of Oregon's dairy companies. Of course, Ch Tillamook, Rogue Creamery. Um, the one in the bottom is Fern's Edge, no, River's Edge. And then we have, actually, no, there's two. The very low pyramid is Fern's Edge. The one in the middle in the maple leaf is River's Edge. Band and Cheese, closest to me here. And on the top, there's Yuma Pine Creamery over from Milton Freewater. And of course, Willamette Valley Cheese Company from your local creamery. And I know we're low in time, otherwise I would talk more about them, but they're fascinating creameries. And in the middle, you have um, more of our different uh, from a cheese festival. If you want to, there's a couple of occasions in Oregon each year where all the cheesemakers come together to show off their cheeses. One is the wedge in Portland in the fall, and the other one is the cheese maker dinner uh, and uh, cheese festival in uh, Central Point in, in March. Okay, so quickly, and I'm going to go through this pretty quickly because we do want some time for questions. But this is what the creamery looked like at OSU when I came. It was shut down and been shut down for decades. Uh, this is the one and only cheese, cheese vat. Definitely museum worthy, Starry's <laughs> facility. So then we got a, a donation from Paul and Sandy Abafnot. And this is really to show that people can make a difference. Because they helped us upgrade the creamery, upgrade the lab, how it looks now. The dairy classroom, this is how it looks now after we updated it. So we run a lot of extension classes, cheese making for our artists and cheese makers, bring in people from all over the world to train our cheese makers. We are business incubators, so people can come in, make cheese, and sell it. If we let them uh, uh, work with us for about a year, then we, it's time for them to move on and start up their own company. Uh, and then, of course, we have a production of cheeses by our students. We am uh, using milk from the OSU uh, dairy farm as well. So great training of our students, and this is our, our logo. And here's some more students working making cheese. And, um, uh, all, and here they are selling cheese. So uh, that was just, uh, if you ever have some good friends from uh, docs, or even from the other universities in Oregon, I suggest you send them OSU cheese for, for Christmas. <laughs> it's bound to uh, annoy a lot of people. And it's really good cheese, so uh, <laughs> we'll take that. But with that, I am through with my presentation. I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. And I'm told that I'm not allowed to call on you, that the microphone is supposed to make its way around to you. So I'll answer uh, This those. is Barbara over here. Where do we get the, the beaver cheese? 
Uh huh. Good, good question. <laughs> you can order it online. You can just Google, and it'll take take you to the place. You can get it at market of choice. McMenamins, a lovely company that's owned and operated by OSU graduates. Most of the cheese you get there at the McMenamin store uh, restaurants will be uh, our cheese. A lot of the breweries fried cheese curd in uh, mostly around Cavallis, though. But we sell a lot to the breweries. So, um, yeah. My name is Charlene. On one of the graphs that you had of the traditional going down and the artisan, I noticed that the artisan graph had a dip in it. Was that a reason for that? Yeah. So the artisans, even though the cheese is really expensive and you might think they earn a lot of money, they really don't. And we had a lot of artisan start up over the last decade, decade and a half. And, um, they never have earned enough money to hire enough employees. So it's really, besides being challenging economically, it's really challenging physically. It's hard work. And what I've seen is people burning out physically after about a decade of this. So that's why in, our, in my research, we ended up focusing a lot of the economics of cheese making to try to help people to earn more money so they could uh, actually hire the help they need. But yes, what you saw was people who had been in business for 10 to 15 years and just couldn't anymore. Hi, uh, I'm Roz. Could you talk about the role of heating or cooking cheese? Because I didn't see it mentioned when you were talking about the process, but like in Switzerland, you know, a dairy farmer up in a little valley, I've seen them make cheese and they were stirring it in a big uh, copper kettle over a fire. Yeah, so um, the cheese I showed you, the Monto is a raw milk cheese, so it's not pasteurized. Main he heating that happens is pasteurization, that you heat it up to kill the pathogens and destroy most of the spoilers bacteria. However, in the Swiss cheeses that you saw with the fire under the copper kettles, they actually don't heat it enough to pasteurize. What they do, they heat it enough to destroy the, the starter cultures. Remember how we use salt to kill the starter cultures? Because the Swiss cheeses are so large, when you put them into the salt brine, even if you have it in the brine for up to two, three weeks, it takes even longer for the salt to penetrate and stop the bacteria from working in the center of these large cheeses. So Swiss cheeses are all made with a step that heats the curds and whey to about 135, 140 degrees as a way to kill the starter cultures. So that's why you see those, those photos. Hi, Deanna here. Why did they start coloring the cheddar cheese orange in the first place? And my second question is, why do some cheeses have rind and some don't? Okay, so the coloring, and they're good questions as well. Color, they're colored because the winter and summer milk looks different based on, especially in the past, based on what the cows were eating. So if you colored it, it would all look the same. Uh, so that was basically a way to make cheese look the same color year round. Um, so, oh man, what was the second question? Rind. Oh, the rind, yes. So, um, most European cheeses traditionally are not aged in plastic wrapping. So those cheeses, as uh, water evaporates from the surface of the cheese, it'll dry out and you get the cheese rind. In contrast, in the US, basically all our cheeses are aged in a plastic vacuum pack, and that means there's no rind being developed because there's no moisture loss from the, from the surface. Hi, this is Virginia. I have a very sort of particular question. Uh, your very first picture that showed all of the cheeses being produced in the United States, there was one that looked slightly like one of my favorite cheeses, which is a scamorza. Do you know if that is a cheese that's being produced in the United States? <laughs> I'm sure they're producing it somewhere, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to answer that because I really don't know. But you will, you will find it, I'm sure. The challenge is that these cheeses are produced in low quantities, so you basically have to know the farmer's market they're being sold at. On, on, your, um, on your map about the 
cheese factories, etc. You showed that on the Columbia, Desperately looking for Safeway the, oh, and okay. Kroger have something. What? And, and, and they were the only two businesses that I recognized uh, nationwide, shall we say. So what do Safeway and Kroger have? So Kroger and Safeway are some of the largest dairy processors in the U.S. because they produce the products they sell in their stores. So Kroger is on uh, Swan Island in Portland and uh, produces huge amounts of fluid milk, whereas uh, Safeway is in Clackamas, the Safeway Dairy, now it's Albertson Safeway, and they produce all the yogurt for the West Coast is produced there. The Safeway, or Lucerne, Lucerne brand, of course, yogurt. Uh, Meredith here. I just want to know, um, explode whether it's myth or fact. Um, yellow, uh, back in the era of talking about cholesterol, many, many books said eat only white cheddar cheese or white cheeses, not yellow cheeses. They're much higher in cholesterol. Is this true or not? So I'm not a dietitian, but I can answer with complete certitude that that is false. <laughs> okay, good, good. <laughs> However, okay. I also want to say, since cholesterol came up, that you've probably heard there's been a complete reformulation of the, impo of the connection between dietary cholesterol and serum cholesterol in that after decades of telling people that the more cholesterol you eat, the more cholesterol you'll have in your body, that is turning out not to be true. It was, you know, counterintuitive, but there is not this connection. So you probably heard now there's not this warning about you can't eat egg, for example. Uh, so, so the dietary um, teachings ha are changing now. It's slow, but there's less of a fear of cholesterol and obviously more of a fear of sugar today in our diets. Okay, and another myth or fact, really quick, Derigold is said to pasteurize its milk two times, two times pasteurization, so it lasts longer than other milk past the throwout date. Is this true or not true? Not true. So what they do in the facility in Portland, they do something called ultra-pasteurization. Normal pasteurization is heating milk to about 172 degrees. Dairy Gold heats the milk in only in the, what, the containers you see UP written on it. They are heated to about 240 degrees, or even up to 280 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's, of course, done with pressurized steam. Otherwise, you'll have everything boiling off. So it's done in unique, very expensive uh, pasteurization systems. And that does, does destroy both the bacteria and most of the spores, so you can store it for a longer time. It's not quite the same as UHT milk in Europe or Africa and Asia that is shelf-stable. UP milk still has to be stored under refrigeration, but it can last for well over 30 days. Uh.